Hello, everybody. I am recording to you right now from my new office, which is my apartment. So if you didn't already know, I resigned from my position as director of expressive therapies last Friday, just a few days ago, and I am officially leaping into the solopreneur world. And um, I don't know if that could have been possible without this podcast, because I think that that was the um, the agent of change here that has evolved, um, has allowed me to evolve into doing a lot of things on my own and taking my creative visions into action. So thank you, everybody. Thanks for always supporting me and coming back and listening. And I'm just so excited about this journey. And I know it'll have its ups and downs, but... Um, as always, I, your support always means a lot to me. So I now have way more time and space to really do the work that I want and to work with the people that I really want. Um, I've, I've finished putting all my services out there on the website. Uh, I had an offer last week that I'm extending into this week for $20 off any introductory session with me. And what I'm offering is business coaching, dance movement session, and supervision. So those are all, all the prices and details are on my website on that link that I'm going to paste in the podcast episode notes. So if you've been thinking about working with me, then this is a really great chance to just dip your toes in, get to see what it's all about, and see if we are a great fit for working together and see how I can help you. So you can take $20 off until this Sunday at midnight, which is Eastern U.S. time. So click on the link and either leave a comment or send me a message if you're interested and we'll get that set up. So for today's episode, I brought Amber Gray back onto the podcast and uh, we actually met in real life after our last interview, which is episode 10 at the conference and we just were saying it'd be great to have her back on and talk about her work with Stephen Porges who founded the polyvagal theory and this is what Amber is talking about today it, it is I just want to warn you it is really complex material I would categorize it as advanced learning for dance movement therapists and related professionals it's probably not something that is super easily digestible as a first-time listener of this, uh, the polyvagal informed dance movement therapy, but um, it is really rich and really valuable, and I think if you haven't really studied any of this before, then at least it's a nice introduction, and then you can go and research it a little bit more or take any one of the workshops that Amber mentions at the end of this episode. So I'm really excited to share this and you can hear and feel Amber's passion for this work uh, through your speakers. I definitely felt it through our interview and I hope you enjoy. This is Mind Your Body, a dance movement therapy perspective on the integration of our emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual aspects of our being into one more aware and whole existence. I'm Amber Gray, and I'm a dance movement therapist and a continuum teacher and somatic psychotherapist and refugee mental health torture treatment, a human rights psychotherapist. And the work, the work that, I'm, that I've done or I'm doing with, with Dr. Stephen Porges, I'm going to call it an organic collaboration that started 20-something years ago, probably 20 or 21 years ago. I was at one of those really big conferences in Boulder, Colorado with, with a lot of the well-known trauma therapists, somatic therapists. And Stephen was speaking about the listening project and his work with autism and bringing in some threads to the relationship between his many years of work with autism and what he speculated might be going on with working with survivors of trauma. And this was the first time I'd heard of social engagement, polyvagal theory. And I remember being captivated, like stuck to my seat, captivated because of what he was saying about relationship and face-to-face -face interaction and healing and thinking about my work with survivors of torture, which, which is, this was 20 years ago. It's still the work that I'm doing. 
and the distortion of that in service of human suffering, which is what torture is. It's a distortion of an empathic relationship. It's the exploitation of that relationship in service of suffering and oppression and power. So I asked a question. I don't know what the question was. It had, it was something about that. And he said, talk to me during the break. I'll meet you Mm -hmm. at the back. And that started phone calls and dialogues and check-ins and teaching together. We've taught together in many places, Denmark, Australia, Norway, the United States, various places. And I call it an organic collaboration because a lot of what would happen is out of those teaching together or the times that I was, you know, had the privilege to spend some time with Steve, he, he'd give me homework or home play. I remember at one particular conference that I actually helped put together in Santa Fe where he and I spoke together with other colleagues, um, Stanley Rosenberg. He said, your homework is to observe the sacrum, um, the, to look at the warrior sacrum because of work I was doing with veterans at that time and keep developing what you're doing and, and feedback. So, you know, I would call it, it's also an organic collaborative feedback relationship. A lot of, I observe this, I have questions, bring them to him. We talk about it. He it might be an email. It might be a phone conversation. He might send me something and say, Hey, read this. And then the development of more theories and ideas, I think, I think feeding into some of his research as well. Um, Anytime I have a crazy idea, even if I say to people, I'm like, that sounds really out there, I'll be like, you have to listen to this. Is this possible? But it's also, you know, I'm also taking, after 20 years, taking a lot of the information, and sometimes I'm the laboratory or my clients are the laboratory. I've been I've been signing my la- my clients up and saying, this is an idea I have. Can we try this? And so, mm. Oh, yeah. I'm curious to hear more about that. Where are the really common denominators that you have, t- you two have met from the start of your relationship that's carried on through the 20 years? You know, I'm going to say a passion for humanity. One of the things that I love about Stephen is how much he cares. And I mean that very sincerely. So he's clearly very well known. His work, I think, has permeated and infiltrated many, you know, many different psychotherapy schools and practices and disciplines, the trauma world in general. Um, and it's really from a heart centered place. And I mean, and the heart is, you know, very, very central to the polyvagal theory in ways he would just be able to describe scientifically that I'm, that I'm playing with clinically. He really cares that his work assists and supports clinicians to help clients who are traumatized He really cares that his work, and I'm going to add, you know, his beautiful wife, Sue Carter, all her work with with oxytocin, that it helps clients, that clients who are suffering, especially at the hands of, um, you know, human rights abuse, unkindness, I mean, cruelty. And and I think that's why I do the work that I do. I've been a fierce advocate for social justice and human rights and animal rights since I, as long as I can remember, and I've when I asked my parents, they agree. They're like, yes, you've always, you know, like you always stood up for the underdog. You were always defending, standing up for, you know, little animals, people. So I think that's, that's a common denominator. Mm -hmm. I also think curiosity is one. I actually remember on my, I think my 45th birthday, it was one of those numbers. It was kind of like, you know, Mm -hmm. decades over. I was with my parents in Destin, Florida. They, they were, wintering there and we were walking on the beach and the beach is a really soft white sand and I found a perfect tiny tiny baby um sand dollar tiny and at the same time I wept because this tiny sand dollar was already dead I mean it was on the beach it was dry and I exulted at the beauty of it and was like this must be my birthday present this is the most beautiful thing that the world could have given me and my dad just kind of stood and he said in some ways, you haven't grown up at all. <laughs> and I think that curiosity and, and openness to, to the world is, and, and looking at him and what he's accomplished, because I think he's extraordinarily brilliant. And and a lot of brilliance isn't just academic. He's so open and engaged and willing to hear new and crazy ideas and to really push the frontiers of where his research and his science goes. So I think that's a common denominator. I don't have his brilliance or his research abilities, 
but I have the curiosity and the openness and the willingness to um, play, you know, take pl- play, play just maybe a step farther than play outside the box, I guess is the word mm-hmm. to use. Yeah. I mean, I, as a therapist, there's often that caution and there's that tendency, and I, I do it myself, to think, well, this is my role and this is my limits. And more and more, I'm like, you know, who said it? Yeah, who said- I remember you talking about that during our last interview, and I, it stuck with me a lot. I think it actually made a big impact on what I'm doing yeah. currently. Uh, yeah, yeah. So thank you for that. Um, I want to take a step back and just um, not sure if everyone is familiar with the polyvagal theory. So could you explain it, describe it a little bit in a way that everyone can understand? Hopefully. Um, <laughs> so it just makes me go, oh, can I really do this? Well, you know, the polyvagal theory, I mean, that's the name of the theory. I'm going to call it an emergent theory describes um, Dr. Stephen Porges work that arose out of his, if now I may not be totally accurate, I believe it was his dissertation research. I think he was asking some questions and looking into some, doing some research and, and some of the discoveries that he made about um, what was understood about the autonomic nervous system. And my recollection is that it was the tendency to describe, I'm going to use the term, the stress response which is something I've heard, you know, Stephen question a bit, because we really in the polyvagal theory talk more about exposure to fear or I mean, exposure to danger or life threat and fear and terror as the emergent emotional response. But looking at, at the stress response, um, that all of the work was focusing on the sympathetic adrenal activation and that there was always that sympathetic adrenal activation, even in what were called free states. And in discovering Cannon's work on voodoo depth, People who just drop dead because of, you know, a shock or we call it an exposure now. And, you know, his 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 question, is there a, a parasympathetically driven or guided or mediated behavioral strategy in response to what is often called stress, but is really, we now know, life threat and the, and the terror that we experience. And so that's the polyvagal theory. So in his work, discovering that the vagus nerve is... Um, multi-branched you know it has that there are two circuits the ventral vagal and the dorsal vagal and the physiological structure and role of each of those um they're obviously connected there's obviously feedback communication between them but the relationship it's recognizing the role of the autonomic nervous system and more specifically the vagus nerve in helping us appraise respond to negotiate, be in relationship with, engage with space, the environment, world, people around us. And that by virtue of evolution, the increased demand for, you know, oxygen, all the things that make us human and this streaming that we call evolution that's still ongoing as far as I'm concerned, the role the ventral vagal circuit plays in inhibiting more ancient behavioral strategies that evolution gives us but that are not really... Um, efficient. So it's recognizing the neurological, physiological nature of those behavioral strategies and how we, I don't know if you can say dissolve, but dissolve backwards into those, in those moments of exposure. Into the older, more ancient responses. Yeah. Yeah. Uh uh Yeah. We become, I mean, you know, when I talk about the amygdala and the limbic system, of course, when there was a lot of interest in the brain and the trion brain, you know, I always say it's becoming more more mammalian in sort of the animal emotional sense. So really it's it's the dorsal vagal complex, the dorsal vagal circuit, the the gut, which is I believe related to the gut brain, right? There's a lot of new research now about the gut brain, but all those innervations in, in the viscera, that's the root of our interoception, right? Interoception travels the spine, the pathway of interoception is the spine. Um, our inner knowing, our deep knowing. And so so one of the things, you know, very scientifically, the ventral vagal circuit, the innervations inhibit the sympathetic adrenal response at the heart in the right sinoatrial node. Literally, that's the vagal break. So knowing that part of this more complex, more highly evolved social nervous system that we have that gives us the ability to be as expressive as we are, as prosodic as we are, you know, as intimate um, through our face which is a reflection of our heart through that highly myelinated vagal pathway that goes from heart to the face and information that comes back down. Um, That's what makes us human. 
um, you know, dogs and, you know, other more highly evolved mammals are certainly expressive, but we do have a very particular ability for expression and for reading faces. And that's really where we connect. I mean, you know, we, we don't sniff butts like dogs do or <laughs> you know, we well, an animal. I mean, you don't. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, and dogs, of course, look at faces, but it's just that. Yeah. So that that. So that's, I mean, that's a very, I don't know if that was clear or not, but just the recognition that we have these biologically based physiological responses afforded us by evolution that are in service of our survival in exposure to danger or to, or life threat. Mm -hmm. That's what it means by dissolution. We become primal. We become more animal. We, we, we fall back on these old behavioral strategies being mobilization or immobilization, the shutdown. Mobilization is the fight flight. And they're really important and necessary. Um, but what happens for those of us who are working with survivors of trauma is we're working with states of traumatization that are that imprint that hasn't, that hasn't restored. You know, the person has not restored their balance. Our equilibrium, our, our, we appraise everything as dangerous or life-threatening when it's not. What we're taking in... Um, we appraise as dangerous or and then we react to it so we're not fully engaged with life so you know i think i think it's the recognition it's the it's the neurological basis of human behavior that that the polyvagal theory has really highlighted um i think it's enhanced a lot of people's understanding of that but but i think it's also recognizing one of the most important things that arises from it is how important the body is in the restorative process. Mm -hmm. I don't like to say healing. I don't like to just limit it to therapy. I don't like the term recovery, which I've probably talked about before. Um, and then movement, because it directly accesses the neurological underpinnings of everything. So when we move, we're speaking with the nervous, right? We're in dialogue with the nervous system. There's a dance there. Yeah. And yeah. Can I reflect back what you were, you were describing the polyvagal theory before we get into that? Just so... Yeah. I make sure that I'm hearing it right and then also digesting it for the audience as well. So you're saying through evolution as humans, old, in older times we had this older part of our vagus nerve, which you called it ventral. Well, the dorsal vagus, yeah. Yeah, and then over time, because we've been socializing and evolving in that way, we've developed a newer myelinated vagal branch, I guess you called it. Yeah. Yeah. And that has allowed us to become more expressive. I mean, it's kind of like co-developed together this. Yeah. As we socialize more, we have developed this ability to express more through our, through voice and through eye contact and face-to-face -face engagement. Yeah. I mean, our, our interactions are more, I'm going to use the word complex, you know, I mean, it's beautiful to watch two snakes mate and that dance that they do. I've seen them. It's beautiful. Our, our way of expressing and engaging is more complex. There's more diversity. There's more variability. And that's a direct outcome of, um, you know, one of the things that I've heard Stephen talk about a lot is it's the increased metabolic demands. The more we complexified as a process, I, rather than system, I mean, the human body or system, we're a process, a physiological, biological, emotional, cognitive, spiritual process. But that biological process we are, um, the more demands there were for oxygen, we went from four-legged to two-legged, we're thinking upright. That changed the nature of the heart. I mean, the heart has to pump blood vertically, right? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you know, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I remember reading that sea snakes have their heart, I think it's down their belly and land snakes it's up closer to like the where, where a heart would be and then tree snakes is it even closer to the head because of the demands on it they climb up and down i hope i got that right but it was that, that whether it's a sea a land or a tree snake their hearts are in slightly different places hmm. so you know as 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 in species evolution we're just apparently one of the most complex and quote-unquote advanced species there are many times i question that <laughs> But yes, so that's that's the complexity of being human. That's the it's also the richness and the magic and the intensity. Um, but all of these innervations in the face, which Stephen referred to, social nervous system, mm -hmm. cranial nerves five, seven, nine, ten, eleven. That's what gives us that expressivity of the face. 
head turning vocalization. Um, and um, that's more highly myelinated, you know, which, which is the myelin sheath. You know, I always say this is high speed internet. <laughs> the head to the heart is high speed. And yeah. then, mm-hmm. and um, I think the dorsal vagal is unmyelinated. It's unmyelinated. So very slow dial up, you know, it's like mm. that old, old internet where it's like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> It's so it's more primal and some species that are still at a certain point in time in evolution, that's where they are. But, but I think, you know, what's interesting about what we're discovering about belly brains and heart brains. I mean, I learned that the heart was a involuntary pump, right? Muscle pump. It's not, it's 60% neural tissue. It has a vast um, network of um, neural pathways. So does the gut. That's what all this research is on nutrition and intelligence and disease and all of that. Um, so the communication that goes from belly to brain to head, you know, all of that travels the, I call it the, it's the vagal highway, right? It's the vagal pathway and it starts really slow, but it's not less important. I mean, that's our deep inner knowing. I mean, that expression, trust your gut. Mm -hmm. There's a particular primal essential intelligence there. Yeah. I think I read one time that they, uh, someone was experimenting on mice and because it's a bi-directional pathway, I'm maybe getting this wrong, but they cut off the pathway from the body to the brain and their basically alarm system was all off and they were behaving differently. So that yeah. trust your gut, that piece of advice is like, oh yeah, that, that exists. That's real. Yeah. And, and, you know, people used to talk about that, you know, that when the hair stands up in the back of your neck or you see it on an animal or that chill that often goes up the spine, you know, as spinal reflexes. Mm. But um, it's it's the pathway of interoception. Um, Fatima Hindi wrote a, a, a piece, I think it's 2011, in the American Journal of Dance Therapy on interoception and dance movement therapy. I don't remember the title. It's brilliant. It's a brilliant mm-hmm. piece. And, you know, she really talks about this. And, I did read recently, people were saying, is it possible that, you know, that neurological communication from belly to brain doesn't just travel the vagus nerve? Does it travel all these neural pathways? I mean, I don't know. But, um, you know, we know 80% of information is afferent. It goes from belly to brain. Only 20% brain to belly, this, this information that comes in. So in that deep knowing that um, old wisdom is very, very important, um, our complexity is the ability for that to travel up through the heart and then up, you know, into our brain and to help us decide how, you know, how, how we're going to move. And I mean that in a very broad sense, not just am I going to get up fast or slow, but how do I move in this world? How do I be in this world? Um, and the vagal break is that ventral vagal inhibition on the sympathetic adrenal at that, what does that right mean? atrial node of the heart. Um, and there's also a dorsal vagal break um, when we shut down. So it's in that moment of, life threat when we feel terror there is not a sympathetic adrenal moment there's not a sympathetic sympathetic adrenal charge the dissolution bypasses that moment in evolutionary history as it lives in our body and we immediately shut down so I, I call that's a dorsal vagal break um and that's that was the discovery that i think a lot of people still don't fully understand i still hear, hear people describe it as we always pass through that sympathetic adrenal, that mobilization and fear, there is a complete shutdown that is, you know, there is a freeze that that is a sympathetic adrenal, parasympathetic brake accelerator tension, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about that complete shutdown that bypasses that. So going Uh, from, let's say, standing up in a room to um, shutting down. Yeah. Yeah. Fainting. Fainting. Uh Blue death. Or shutting down. I mean, you know, we might be, it might be like, you know, I was just about to, I don't know, we walk out and it's a beautiful day and who knows, I'm, you know, moving in the way that I move and I'm stretching and all of a sudden, you know, shut down um, because what I am exposed to induces terror. Um, And, you know, we know that there's a a relationship between, in the old days, the behavioralists talked about um, peritraumatic dissociation as putting us at higher risk for traumatization or post-traumatic stress disorder the immobilization response i think it's really i would call it a reaction that's that's my language um puts us at higher risk for depression and if it's if sustained immobilization which human beings can't tolerate because we can't sustain 
oxygen deprivation for that long. We don't hibernate, right? We can't do that. Increased risk for, for um, suicidality. Um, the shutdown response is not, it's not sustainable in humans. So that's why a lot, I, I think the immobil immobilization in terms of clinical work or therapeutic work, it's often the hardest to work with. The dissociation, complete isolation, mm -hmm. shutdown, um, people who are unidimensional, right? Completely apathetic, no yeah. affect. So Very severe, strange. like severely depressed. Are you talking about yeah. fugue states as well, or yeah, the disappearance of the self. You know, the mm -hmm. loss of the of the of the expressivity of the self. You know, for me, what polyvagal theory is, and I, you know, I'm hoping that I didn't botch any science in my description, <laughs> but. I like to think of the nervous system as a stellar constellation. You know, it's my colleague Bonnie Ginta says it's really a process. It's like a stellar constellation that guides us in and out of our interactions with the world. Um, from a clinical perspective, you know, where this is helpful is I think it's really helped those of us who work therapeutically understand the intensity and strength of these states that are so essential. If I didn't mobilize in fear and, and, and fight or flight, I would not have escaped. I would not have gotten rid of the threat, you know, whether it maybe make a, hell of a deadly snake or something, whatever I had to do. If I didn't immobilize, I might have been perceptible. I might have been seen. I might have been eaten. I might have been shot at. I might have been raped. I might have been, um, there's something that I avoided in that. Um, so those become the states that we're working with in the ways that we describe them, anxiety, depression, hyperarousal, mm -hmm. dissociation, uh, you know, whatever it is. And I think that's what the polyvagal theory means to me as a dance movement therapist um, and as a dance movement therapist, it's the recognition that we have the most powerful way to intervene, which is movement. There's no, there's no more powerful way. And when I say movement, you know, sound are on a continuum, sound and movement are on a continuum. So all the things that we work with from breath, every movement begins with a breath. Every dance begins with a movement, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it might be a breath work. It might be basic structured movement practices. It might be working with gestures. We might choreograph something, recognizing that movement's that primary language. And the, Bruce Perry says it grows the brain faster than anything. I like to say movement, you know, gives us access to the, you know, neurological underpinnings of everything. We're automatically dancing with the nervous system when we move. And when we're immobilized we can't move so once movement is introduced of any sort even a inhale exhale we're shifting away from that most dangerous uncomfortable state of immobilization hmm. this is clear oh is yeah yeah i have okay. a little background though so so i hope <laughs> i hope it's clear for who's listening to but i mean it's clear to me i've explored this before but i think yeah, maybe you can reflect back about how movement, the way that movement dances with our nervous system. So could mm -hmm. you give examples of how that works, maybe either in a case? Well, you know, I mean, I just think, I mean, I'm sitting here and I'm going to, you know, have my legs crossed, which I know is a bad idea. And I'm going to put both legs on the ground. But you know, if I lift an arm, I mean, just even I'm lifting my right arm right now. I created fee a feedback loop, right? I'm lifting my arm. So whoever I am in this world today and what, you know, a raised right arm and verticality and um, elongating the muscles and, you know, the breathing, um, that's going to create feedback to my nervous system and my state's going to change. So state shifting is a term that Stephen and I started using quite early on. I'm really interested in ancient healing practices, um, shamanism, and um, Stephen's been incredibly open to, to that and has studied yoga and ancient chanting and those things and recognizing that what the, you know, the ancients have done with state shifting, which is what, and this comes from my work in Haiti as a, as a sevito. I mean, that's my spiritual tradition. So in the ceremonies that I'm part of down there or anywhere where I work with indigenous or more ancient earth-based healing practices, it's state shifting. And I, I kind of made that link, I don't know, maybe eight years in of after meeting Steve was like, Oh, I was dancing in a, actually in a voodoo ceremony. I was like state shifting. This is what it is. And it's the, there's the mystery of it. And then there's the neurological practicality of it. So, um, so state shifting, meaning shifting between parasympathetic and sympathetic or between mobilization and immobilization. So. And all the very fine areas in between. So sleepy to slightly awake 
to alert to hypervigilant or ecstatic and joyful, and I'm not saying they're the same thing, to sad. Phone call rings, I get some news. You know, I've been dancing around, feeling completely liberated, dancing to my favorite Melissa Etheridge song. I'm just going, yeah, you know, moving. Get a phone call, I'm suddenly sad or I'm angry, Mm -hmm. right? That's a sudden state shift. We're always state shifting. This is what I teach in in the polyvagal informed movement therapies, and it's, it's very much an integration of modern science, the most current neuroscience, and what I'm learning from my the various mystery schools that I've been privileged to dip into. Um, so these, I feel like I went off on a tangent. Um, we were talking about, oh, a case you wanted to Yeah, finish, but. but now I'm curious about say shifting, because if you're dancing around, aren't you in your sympathetic state? And then also, and then if you get angry, aren't you still in your sympathetic state? I mean, right. I'm, is it with fear or without fear, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So, and again, I'm not, you know, I like to say love and fear are kind of the primary emotions that everything roots or springs from. I mean, you know, that's that's my idea. So I always say with mobilization, there's a continuum, right? Mo- mobilization without fear are play states. Stephen talks about it as play. There's erotic play. There's competitive play. There's soft, gentle play, you know, somebody... Um, stroking your hair, you know, or um, playing volleyball, or sometimes I go in our hot tub when I want to create a continuum, you know, movement sequence, I'm teaching a class, and I'm moving, or um, when I'm in the ocean, you know, and I suddenly become much more of the fluid, fluid nature that we really are. So we play in many different ways. So there's just as many mood states, affect states, feeling states, they're, they're, those are all different. But really, in some ways, I think I look at the, you know, psychological or behavioral language, they're states. So I can be happy. I can be elated, mm-hmm. be content. So there's a continuum. So um, the mobilization and immobilization, you know, those were like, think of them as um, soil. You know, they're like, these are all like sprouts that come from that, that soil. You know, another way to think of it is I often say, you know, the fear is what, removes the the fear state is what removes the creativity or the fertility so immobilization without fear is a deep what i call rest and settle a blissful state meditation um digesting a really good meal um love making and then that deep rest afterward jet lag you know flying i do a lot of this flying and there's a certain point where it's like oh i can just tell it's going to be a great sleep and i'm on that edge uh-huh. immobilization and in fear doesn't have that creativity or possibility it's a shutdown so but those also right those are states too and that's what I look for in clients I mean just to come back to your question I am actually thinking of of a a man from the Middle East who I work with who you know no matter what he was saying doing or talking about his face scowl get a scowl Mm -hmm. I know people can't see me but I you know bring in my eyebrows I'm furrowing them and I'm kind of frowning and he would talk and he wasn't happy I mean he was exposed to three IED explosions, the witness of a witness, the murder of a family member, lots of war, lots of lots of exposures living alone in the United States. Some family members had chosen to go back. So very isolated in his world, in his context, in his in his life. Um, and it also experienced several shutdowns. One explosion in particular, what he described to me was a complete shutdown in the moment of that exposure. So there's the imprint. And that's, that's what I mean by the dance. If we tend to be shut down, if we have that imprint, it can become our behavioral go-to every time there's something like, mm-hmm. it might not be an IED explosion. It might be a muffler or somebody dropping, you know, a plate on the floor, not evolutionarily or behaviorally or, or biologically necessary to react that strongly, but we do. Um, those are states as well, those reactions. So he, um, one of his complaints, one of his concerns was he was having a hard time meeting people and he knew he wanted to be in relationship again, and but he felt like he was kind of repelling people and, and he was starting to feel more morose and more down and going into these longer episodes. He always had episodes of depression, not uncommon after his exposures in mobilized states that were, there was a setup but longer episodes of depression, of not wanting to leave. And he knew that that wasn't good. So as we were talking about this, one day I looked at him and I asked him to talk about a conversation with a woman Um. that he'd had in a gym. 
who he found interesting, and he thought initially she was interested. And and the way that he described how she kind of disappeared, I looked at him, and I was watching him, and his face didn't change the whole time he talked about it. He still had that scowl, mm. that scowl he always had. And I finally said, do you think your face showed what you meant to say or express and what you felt? And he sat up, and he goes, my face never does. My face never shows what I feel. I said, how do you know that? He says, I feel it. You know, I, I would invite anybody listening to just scowl. Right? Bring your, knit your eyebrows together and do that kind of scrolling. Mm -hmm. You feel it. It's heavy. Yeah. It takes a lot of tension. It was getting headaches, a lot of headaches. Mm -hmm. So that's where we started. So I said to him, okay, we're going to change your face because the way human beings understand one another initially, the way that we read one another, where we look for the cues to let us know if somebody is safe or interesting or desirable or whatever it is, begins with the face. It also gave me a portal into talking about his nervous system. So we had two things. I worked with something called a tuning board created by Daryl Sanchez. And people can Google those online. They're brilliant. Um, he's been creating them and refining them for, gosh, at least 20, 25 more years. Different densities of foam packaged in certain ways so that you can actually stand on them. It's not a traditional wobble board. The foam density is very specific to weight. And therefore, to the feedback that standing on it gives the nervous system because it's not stable standing. It's like standing on the ocean or on a, mm. well, for a, for, a, for a healthy nervous system, it, it can be pleasurable. For a nervous system that's constantly appraising, finding date in its appraisals, it may not be pleasurable or comfortable. So we started working with um, what I call polyvagal informed grounding. I would teach him to ground. So I was starting to get him to experience his relationship, his energetic relationship to the earth and to ground and to support and then get on the board. And the first time he got on the board, he says, Oh my gosh, he did this big sigh. And he says, I feel like I just relaxed. Wow. It cued his nerve. Now, not everybody reacts that quickly or responds. It cued his nervous system to slow down and to take a bigger exhale. That mm. feedback, right? Mm. Um, efferent you know came in from the environment of whatever whatever feedback that gave him his body just told him to relax cued him to relax so we would titrate that a little bit on the board stand changing relationship i work with baselines there's got to be something that we can return to to notice what's changed because people come to therapy for change or to celebrate i always say if, if it doesn't change people often go oh my gosh i'm not getting better no we celebrate the steadfastness of the human body and its ability to protect us and to keep us where we need to be until it's safe enough to change. Mm. So looking at that, um, longer periods on the tuning board, he started to notice longer periods of relaxation on the board and then off the board in the therapy room. So I started to build on that. And then did he take that state of relaxation or calm or feeling like he'd let go of a burden home? What would sustain it at home? He wanted to take a board home immediately I didn't recommend it because they, if you stand on them too long, they can actually be quite provocative. Mm -hmm. uh, there does need to be some facilitation. We are looking into getting it one now. It's been about a year. Um, but the other thing we did was face changes, face faces, making faces, funny faces. And I invited him to go home and make faces in the mirror, and he thought that was the dumbest thing anybody had <laughs> ever told him to do. He's like, I'm not doing that. And what do you? He's like, I'm an adult. I'm a man. I didn't come to a therapist for them to tell me to make faces in the mirror. <laughs> right. No, was, and, we, and I was making faces, and he's like, do you do that? Area? So what we decided he could start with is he loved watching watch birds. And I said, so sit at your window where you can see the birds and the light and the trees and hear the songs and just make faces in, in response to that. Nobody's looking. The birds aren't going to think you're too weird. And he did that. He would watch the birds, and I just said, just doesn't matter if nobody sees you, just face express your response to those birds. And he came in and there was actually more movement in his face. There were little smiles and little, you know, creases in the eyes, little twinkles. And I said, okay, it's the mirror or me. So either you're going to go home and make faces in the mirror or you're going to do them with me. Mm -hmm. He chose the mirror. He was said, that to, to have some face-to-face -face engagement? Yeah, yeah, I wanted him to engage with a human face. Oh. And so he started to do it a little bit. He thought it was a little goofy and weird, but he did it. 
And he noticed then that he'd be doing it, like he'd be out somewhere and he'd suddenly feel himself making a face. But what was he doing? He was waking up, right? Those, those, the social nervous system, um, the nerves that feedback, you know, that are extensions, branches of the ventral vagal circuit, the, the complex. So he was waking up his social nervous system and promoting more state shifts in the direction of social engagement, first with birds, then with the mirror. And then he happened to get married. I mean, he um, met somebody and Uh they got married. It was fairly quickly. And so now they make faces together. She came in, she wanted to meet this therapist and she's come (laughs) in a few sessions and the three of us made faces and she was right. She was on it. She's like, we will make faces at dinner or breakfast. And, um, he has a much broader range of facial expressivity now. I'm shifting it into posture now. He still tends to sit, you know, now now it's about what I call body and movement prosody. You know, Stephen talks about vocal prosody and the ability of the voice to, it's movement in the voice, right? It's not having a monotone, you know, voice. Our body, we have body and movement prosody. That's one of my polyvagal adaptations in dance movement therapy. So now I'm working with that. You make faces... Can you include your shoulders, your hands, your arms, whatever, your chest? Not literally, in the way that you sit, in the way that you stand, in the way you get up. So that's what we're working with now. And what he noticed was more softness, more calmness. Um, he laughs more. He giggles more. I never used to hear him giggle. <laughs> like he does this great giggle. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So that was a, yeah a, a case example, just in terms of both state shifting, but. And I like to use that example because I'm not getting people up and necessarily getting them to do the waltz or Mm. move. I think, you know, there's so many ways. I mean, one of the things I want the world to understand is dance movement therapy is for everybody. It doesn't mean we have to dance in a way that people might feel shy about. Everybody dances. Everybody has rhythm, right? You just put your finger on your, you know, where the pulse is on your neck or put your hand on your sternum and feel feel yourself breathe. We all got rhythm. So it's both trying to recognize how universal dance is, whether it's the most choreographed expression of a story, you know, like the swan's lake, or whether it's just length of my inhale and my exhale. All right. It's all dance. It's all movement. It's all life. Right. Yeah. And I, I love how you brought in the example of working with the movement of the face, which is something that I yeah. haven't really heard about. Well, we're, we're, yeah, it's, it's the portal to our humanity, right? If you start engaging that, uh, you know, I can, I can polyvagalize it very specifically, the ventral vagal circuit, ventral vagus nerve, or I can say it's the face, the eyes are the window of the soul. You know, a lot of ancient cultures talk about the relationship between the brain and the heart. In utero, the fact that, you know, in that fetal curl, they're very connected. Part of what the polyvagal theory has shown us is that connection, the communication between the heart and the brain and how our face really does reflect what we're feeling. And our feelings really are um, connected to our heart's function and our heart's, I want to think of the right word, what our heart is doing. If it's in a sympathetic adrenal, if we lose that inhibition, that ventral vagal inhibition, if we're in a mobilization state with fear, we feel something in the realm of fear. But even in you know, when people, I even think when I'm in a really hyper playful state, I have a less range of feelings than I might when I'm in a more socially engaged or more holistic present state. You know, I might be, I don't know, I can get really like bonkers, you know, I, I mean, you know, I mean, I, you know, aerobics class or just dancing or, you know, just right. get busy and running around and but we're, yeah, there's less range there. So um, when we work with our face and then what we can do as dance movement therapists take that into the whole body, whether it's um, through body parts or the nervous system or just, I mean, there's the, 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 the range of what we can do, the, the um, possibilities for what we can do are huge, but it's a portal to our humanity. And that's, I think, I think psychotherapy is a humanitarian practice. That's what I like to say. Yeah. Us, it should be a humanitarian political party, but I won't go there. <laughs> Um, do you have any little bits of advice about how people listening to this can become more tuned in to approaching dance therapy or whatever their work is from a polyvagal informed way? Um, 
many, you know, listen, listen to Stephen, you know, he does a lot of, I think, online talks, read, I mean, he has a couple books out, um, I have more and more writing coming out, um, I teach regularly, I'm increasingly teaching more and more of the polyvagal and hormone therapies with his blessing, um, for me, I like to, ex I'm one of those people, I like to experience things in my body, so I love to go listen to somebody live, and I love to learn from people, I, and if I go to a mindfulness or meditation, I'm right near the, um, I'm in Santa Fe, so that Upaya um, Zen Center, you know, I often go up there intentionally, it's an exploration to those meditative states, calm and, you know, restful, settled states, um, but studying with people who understand the work, I have something coming out in Currents, the Body Mind Centering Journal, I think any, this summer, mm -hmm. that's polyvagal informed, I have, um, the book, What to Do When Children Clear Them Up in Psychotherapy, a chapter that Stephen and I wrote about polyvagal informed dance movement therapy. His book, Clinical Applications of the Polyvagal Theory, is being released in August. I have a chapter in there that is a case study. I, I, I polyvagalize it very um, through a very complex case with a woman who survived torture for many years. So it's okay. It's yeah, I think it would be helpful to see that all yeah. in writing if you want to send it to me. Yeah, and then do yeah. you, do you just want to tell everyone about your upcoming workshops? Sure. Well, I teach um, a three-part alternate route um, series, and it's called Body is Voice, which is where I teach restorative movement psychotherapy. That's what I call it. But that's all polyvagal-informed, trauma-informed movement, dance movement therapy, movement therapy. Um, I have a couple sort of one-off classes, Restoring Core Rhythmicity, the Art of Embodied Resilience. Restoring Core is happening in Auckland, New Zealand in the weekend of August 10th. Um, I'm teaching the alternate route series in Australia. I'm, I'm teaching it right now in Santa Fe and Austin. I'm going to start it up again, I think, in Santa Fe next year. So I'm teaching at the American Dance Survey at our conference in October in Salt Lake City, um, our 2018 conference. I'm doing a full day intensive before the conference, highlighting polyvagal and um, state shifting. Okay. I have, I, I, my website will soon be up and have everything. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah. Oh, and I have a retreat every year and there's only a couple spaces left. It's called dancing the wild home. And we go to the South Pacific and it's, um, movement therapies and swimming with humpback whales. And it's where a lot of actually the ideas that I'm getting now, I almost always call Stephen when I get back. I'm always, I'm like, I have another idea um, about myelination and the relationship between the heart and the brain and humanity and compassion and evolution. That's a, where a lot of that and it's, yeah, dancing the wild home. It's, that sounds amazing. I think I'm going to start doing two a year because they're getting popular. Hmm. Yeah. Great. This was so informative. Like, I really, so. really I rich. Well, thank you. I know I get excited. I know I talk. That's good though. Cause you can hear that through the speakers. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, again, and what I, what I hope that I offer is the clinical application of it or how it shows up in our work. You know, I'm, I'm working with survivors of human rights abuses. It's been very important. And, you know, I should just add one more thing is I teach a lot of them this. All my clients learn the polyvagal theory all over the world. When I do humanitarian response, I've been in Aceh after the tsunami in Haiti after the earthquake in Darfur during the fighting, you know, when there was ginger weed running around, I teach people this in ways that are culturally and context appropriate. And what it does is it, it it's so powerful to see the, sh the shift that occurs on all levels for people. Suddenly they go, I'm not crazy. There's an, un you know, like this is my body taking care of me. That's a really important and beautiful message for someone to have about what they're experiencing. And it mm -hmm. gives people hope. Oh my God, I can, you know, yeah. And, versus I'm out of control. I can't control yeah. my body or my emotions. Yeah. yeah. That's a beautiful reframe. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of what I teach are the practical ways to do this. Really practical. I teach a lot of practical, simple things that I think anyone can adapt. And then it gets a little more complex when I work with dance therapists. But mm -hmm. Do you I mean practical, either. like breath and specific movements? Yeah. I, I call it structured processes. Structured practices, yeah. Okay. Very intentionally, you know, thinking about the heart or the sacrum, bagel tone, bagel bread, all of that is, is part of it. Um, oxygenation, you know, how we can oxygenate our body. I mean, I do things specifically to promote more oxygen or more oxytocin. 
Mm, sounds fascinating. It's fun. <laughs> I took your workshop at I think two years ago at the conference and where was it? Maryland? Yeah, it was the keynote workshops right after yes. the keynote. Yeah. Those were that was two hours. That was crazy. And there was eighty people in the room and I didn't have lunch because there yeah, the hotel was under construction. Yeah, that was that was going into I remember having to teach and feeling like, okay, I'm completely depleted nutritionally. <laughs> But we got a beautiful movement piece going with breath. I don't even remember that, that huge circle. Oh, yeah. No, I remember it. It was yeah. it was great. And we had um, rhythm in there, and we're, like, yeah. making rhythm and connecting that way. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. It's nice to be with you again. Yeah, same here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening, and thank you, Amber, for that super resourceful episode. And to everyone, if you're interested in working with me, don't forget to click that link in the episode notes for $20 off that you can use until this Sunday, until midnight, Eastern U.S. time. I hope to be working with you and moving with you soon. Bye.